Almighty God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour upon us the abundance of your mercy, we pray. Amen. Amen. For the third week in a row in the Revised Common Lectionary, we are in a vineyard. Jesus has been using the imagery of the vineyard as a tool as he converses with his audience, in this case, the chief priests and elders of the Jewish religious establishment. I think this week's vineyard is the least appealing. In our passage, Jesus details the parable of a vineyard owner who sends servants to gather the harvest and of tenants on that land who greet the servants with fatal violence. The vineyard owner sends more servants, and violence abounds once again. And finally, he sends his son in the hopes that the tenants will treat him differently. But no. Parables are, of course, allegorical. They tell a story in simple or familiar terms in order to reveal a moral message. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's using the imagery of a vineyard, agricultural imagery, which would have been really familiar to his audience, to describe the landscape of the kingdom of God and to describe the behaviors and actions of different people in his landscape, politically and socially and culturally as well we should understand that the parable reflects on the chief priests and elders. Jesus is talking to them, and as it says at the end of our gospel, they eventually realize that he's also talking about them. God is the landowner. The land of Israel is the vineyard. The chief priests and the elders are the tenant farmers. And the prophets of the Old Testament are the servants who come a couple of times to collect the harvest, and Jesus eventually is the son who is sent. From this vantage point, the lesson Jesus is imparting is about greed. It's about the grasping nature of the tenants, of those who hold power and place and privilege in their communities and who will do anything, even to the point of violence, to hold that power, to keep holding it, not to give it up. That's a good lesson. It's a good one for us to reflect on, for any person to reflect on, I think. But I I don't think we should stop there. I think there's more about what Jesus is saying that we sometimes miss. When he finishes giving the parable, Jesus poses this question. Now, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants who have murdered his servants and murdered his son? The chief priests respond. He will put those wretches to a miserable death. D. Mark Davis is a homilist and theologian, and I read his commentary this week and was really struck by by an idea that he posed. He suggests that this story is at its heart about how we think God acts in the world and about how God acts toward the people of this world and about what Jesus is saying in answer to that question and what others are saying. This story is about a cycle of retaliatory violence. The tenants kill the servants, and then again, and then the son. And in that story of violence, Jesus' audience finds an image of God as a participant in that cycle, answering retaliation with revenge a retributive and wrathful God. We are sometimes inclined to attribute this understanding of God 
the understanding displayed in the chief priest's answer, as an Old Testament way of thinking. Let's not do that. To do that forfeits the opportunity for our own self-reflection and at worst perpetuates an attitude of Christian superiority against Jewishness, which diminishes the wisdom of the Hebrew Bible and the wisdom that the chief priests might have had even as they were in opposition to Jesus. Instead, I think we need to ask the question about why their answer would have imagined a God who responds with violence. We know that it is true that as subjects under imperial rule, the Jewish leadership would probably have come to expect through their lived experience that aggrieved rulers respond to some kind of violation with violence. The people who hold political power in that time probably did respond with some sort of show of political force when things went out of line. We know also that the many empires that Israel lived under pretty consistently rejected God's messengers and failed to honor God in the ways that Israel knew were right. And we know from this story and from many other stories across the Gospels that Jesus condemns the chief priests and elders not for their Jewishness, but for their own failure to recognize Jesus and to follow him, even at the cost of their own status and power. Jesus opposes the chief priests because they had become complicit in the forms of authority that served individuals rather than the whole community, the whole community that they were supposed to be taking care of and looking out for. With all of that in mind, it makes sense that they might understand God to act in ways that serve the people in power rather than the entire community. It makes sense when you live in a cycle of violence to imagine that God might somehow be participating or responding in the same patterns as that cycle. I've been given pause this week to wonder how I would respond to Jesus' question, to wonder how I understand God to be working, and in my answer, when it doesn't quite sit right with what I hear Jesus saying in our readings or across the gospel, to wonder why I assume that God acts in one way or the other. And I hope that this week you will also take some time to think about how you believe that God works in this world. When the chief priests respond this way, Jesus answers them with the following. Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces. I admit and recognize that this, especially the part about falling and being broken to pieces, doesn't necessarily sound much better than what the chief priests themselves say. There is still breaking and crushing, it seems, in whatever Jesus is imagining. But I believe that there's a fundamental difference between what Jesus is saying and the response of the priests. I think that they are starting from different places. In his commentary, Mark Davis says, the biblical alternative to revenge is resurrection. The biblical alternative to revenge is resurrection. That the rejected becomes the cornerstone points directly to this truth, I think. The abiding love of God for Israel and for us is not displaced, displaced or reduced by the failures of people in political power. Instead, we have a God who stands above 
the structures of authority and leadership of this land. A God who is always faithful, who always responds with mercy, as our collect of the day says, even when the people of God are not responding with mercy or are unable to do so, even when we cannot grasp what is right in front of us, or when we, out of fear or comfort, grasp onto the power we have. God is faithful. That's where Jesus starts from. God is faithful, and God will do anything to bring us along to where God wants us to be. And the one who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. As your priest and as a companion on the journey of faith, I have to be honest with you that it is often, if not always, the case that truly following God, truly recognizing Jesus and giving him the whole fruits of our lives necessitates a kind of breaking or a kind of sacrifice. We should look to Paul and our reading from Philippians for a good example. Paul, before he started following Jesus, he was really killing it. That guy was great at his job. His job was persecuting Christians, and he was really good at it. He says, my favorite part of that reading is where he's like, in answer to the law, I am blameless. I was blameless. Wow. And he gave it all up. He met Jesus, and he gave up everything that gave him power and wealth and authority and status in the world in which he lived. He handed it all over. That is, in its own way, a kind of breaking. A breaking from what is expected, a breaking from the status quo, a breaking down of what we prioritize or how we understand relationship between one another. It is often the case that when Jesus calls us and we really answer with everything we have, that we find that there is a rupture between how we were and how God calls us to be. But I hope more than anything, if there's anything you take away from church, I hope that it is that you know somewhere within you that that rupture, whenever it might happen, is a place of new life and growth for God, that God doesn't leave breaking points open and cavernous and empty, but instead comes in to fill them with grace, with love, with mercy, and with new life that we cannot even imagine. Let's return to the parable. As the story begins, the vineyard owner, having prepared everything for fruitful living, went to another country. I don't believe that God is an absentee landlord. That's that's not really my understanding of God. But I do believe that God maintains distance sometimes with us so that we can bear our own fruit. God is always present, and God lets there be spaciousness in our lives so that we can produce good works and also make mistakes. It is our work as followers of Christ to remain vigilant to our own understanding of how God is alive in the world so that when we fall right over, having tripped over, the holy cornerstone, we are able to be cracked open, we are able to be made new, and we are able to keep striving on toward that promise of a kingdom where all are equal, where mercy abounds, and where everything comes out of love. Amen. Amen.